Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Voiro podcast, where we do a weekend review of everything we heard, watched, listened to, overheard in the world of the internet, advertising, media, and monetization. With me is Kavita Shanoi, founder and CEO of Voiro, who has been talking about Top Gun since this morning. And I thought we should start with that. How was the theatrical experience? Oh my God. I mean, if I can just play the Top Gun anthem when I get up every morning, I would. I have just been reminded of what great cinema is. I mean, I know it's Top Gun. I went there skeptical because it's you know it's it's a sequel to it. It's Tom Cruise after thirty four years. Did you know that the year that you were born, they actually made Top Gun? My it's goodness. as old as you. Anyway, it was one of those movies where I sat there and I didn't know what to expect. But then when they turned the corner on Tom Cruise and that anthem played, and everybody in the theater was like, "Ooh, you know, there is there is um, there is something to be said about theatrical releases." And I think Paramount has really gotten it right. And we read an article recently, um, I want to say in the Washington Post, about Paramount and how they stuck on. They didn't release yeah, their the New York Times. New York Times. New York Times. And um, they didn't release their um, the 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 movie until this year, and um, there was a whole bunch between Shari Redstone and Bob Backish where they wanted to figure out how they they can address this whole streaming wars business. They assembled a whole bunch of deal makers, tried to figure out whether they need to buy somebody else, whether they need to be bought, and it's come back full circle to what we discussed last week, which is that. They are not here to stand up and spend money in the streaming wars. They are not part of these streaming wars because they are content creators. They are movie makers. They are dream weavers, right? So, I mean, yesterday was just one of those times when I was like, "Oh my God, I love cinema!" And uh, of course, I was telling you there are seven or eight minutes of glorious men ripped with their tan bodies playing, uh, playing offense and defense uh, football on the on the beach. It's a clean, um, great, fun movie. It's got high points. It's got Tom Cruise in a in a plane. It's got like this, uh, you know, your your heart in your mouth kind of moments. Um, Miles Teller is ripped. I can't believe that man can be that ripped. And everybody is just at their peak physical condition. I don't know. I mean, I was I was quite demotivated this previous week. I was finding people were not really um, were not really. Uh, Kind of being a lot more motivated around me, and uh, I guess you just have to watch an inspiring movie or two to the set you back on film. track. Yeah. Incidentally, um, Kara Swisher's podcast had David Ellison on this past week, who's the CEO of Skydance Media, and he was talking about something very similar. Um, apparently, Tom Cruise did not allow them to start filming until he was completely okay with the script because he didn't want to make a bad sequel. Because of the narrative around sequels in general, and this is something we talked about last week as well. Over the last two three years, everyone talked about how the pandemic has effectively killed the theatrical experience, and we saw the big theater conglomerates in India come together, create partnerships, find a way to survive. But I think through all of that, while of course streaming has its its place and its benefits. For financial reasons, as well as for just the sheer experience of what theatrical can offer, I think Top Gun has proved that there's definite magic in in that format. I'm sure Christopher Nolan will be happy. Yes, I'm sure they will. And you know, there is everybody. There's a learning curve for even users and consumers. We kind of find the convenience of watching a movie at home, but nothing beats those two hours enveloped in you know great sound, great Great visuals and nothing to distract you really, except uh, you know your bag of popcorn. Anyway, so this is Upfronts and New Friends Week. What have you been reading? So the Ad Exchanger Talks podcast had um, Alison Schiff interviewing Debbie Weinstein this week, who's one of the vice presidents at YouTube. And of course, that took me down this rabbit hole. I didn't realize that the Upfronts are sixty years old this year. It oh, I didn't know that either. Nineteen sixty-two. Wow. I want to say. And um, it has been a changing narrative. A lot of people don't believe in upfronts. A lot of people say it's one big party where you just bring buyers and sellers together. 
And I think, of course, like anything in our industry, it has been evolving in terms of what it has tried to achieve. But as I was looking into what happened in this year's upfronts in New York City, um, I noticed, and that's what the Ad Exchanger Talks podcast was talking about, that for the first time this year, YouTube held its own upfronts. It had Brandcast, where they put the spotlight on Lizzo, who apparently made it big largely because of what YouTube was able to enable for her, of course, with her own talent. Um, and they had Mark Rober and Mr. Beast, whose revenue from YouTube exceeds the entire revenue made by Pluto TV. Wow. And so obviously YouTube was riding on all of these numbers. And um, when Debbie was asked why YouTube even made a play in the Upfronts week, she said, it's because Upfronts is all about scale. And we have scale, but we're shifting the paradigm, much like any of the new uh, digital platforms are, are doing. Traditionally, Upfronts have been this showcase where you walk buyers through your schedule of programming and try and woo their ad spend in your direction for everything that you're going to release in the fall. And YouTube, of course, can turn that on its head and say, well, we have new programming every day on our platform at the same scale that you would otherwise get. Now, there is an argument to be made, which is why upfronts and why not new fronts, which is typically where all of the digital players are, are uh, uh, going to showcase their own products. But I think there has been this blending across these platforms because even if you look at new fronts, two years ago, Walmart and Target showed up at new fronts. So technically everybody is changing. And I find that there is this move towards one cohesive marketplace across both. And that's why I'm even more interested in where theatrical is going, where linear is going, where connected TV is going, as well as where digital, as well as ad tech players. Xander has a big play now in, in new fronts. In some sense, all of these are merging in each other's directions. Yeah. But I think the original spirit of what Upfronts tries to do, which is guaranteed buys so that you can effectively create this futures marketplace where you give advertisers the best shot at spending their money in the most effective manner. But you also give your teams the ability to uh, unlock as much revenue as possible, which puts the spotlight on ad sales teams, ad ops teams. We are big believers in the future of ad ops as a practice that doesn't just execute, but that focuses on maximizing revenue and yield. And it was interesting to me to see all the shifting dynamics in, in the upfronts yeah. this year. This whole concept of upfront, upfronts is something that uh, resonates with us as well, because even when we started this company, we said, you know, we don't want to have things just happen to us. We want to be very aware and conscious about what we want to do and then pursue it and not just find ourselves serendipitously in many up, you know, uh, you know, points of uh, success. So upfronts is also a take on and it's a, and you know, like everything else, like I was talking earlier as well, you go through a cycle of learning. Initially, everybody was kind of poo-pooing on, on uh, upfronts because, you know, they're like, they're just parading all their content around and so on and so forth. But, well, you know, I, if I was an advertiser, I'd like to know what NBC, ABC, even YouTube has up their sleeve for me this year. What's their strategy? What's their content looking like? Because they're the closest to the audience at the end of the day. Speaking of being close to the audience, there is, like, you, you keep speaking about secondary effects of, of things that happen. There are all these new titles that you're coming across right now. One is upfronts and new fronts. And of course, new fronts can be can be anything from new fronts to, you know, in terms of technology or new fronts in terms of audience, digital platforms, digital yeah. platforms audiences, devices, etc. And you have roles today that are new generational audience development or development of uh, new audiences and new fronts because people want to find newer audiences in a newer space. And TikTok is one of the biggest new things that we have seen in the past in terms of uh, a broad base of audience that has moved from either either not being online and they've discovered TikTok and therefore they are there because the younger audience or they have moved from say an uh, Instagram or a, or a Snap to TikTok. I remember last week's statistic which showed that the top influencers on TikTok make more than Tom Cruise. Oh my today. goodness, really? Right, yeah. It was in Scott Galloway's podcast. A lot of historic upfronts have always been associated with some sort of celebrity endorsement. Um, usually you bring that star value, that Hollywood value, and they associate themselves with either the brand or the network or the content. And 
there is also for me the shift in how celebrities see themselves and they are starting to play a much larger role in the content that they endorse and um also how they make their presence felt in all of these events i remember 2019 is when everyone talked about how reese witherspoon's production company hello sunshine is going to start playing a much bigger role in the upfronts events um the i want to say the disney new fronts this year was opened by steve martin martin short and selena gomez who were uh, stars on the show only murders in the building which is a digital only or a streaming only show if i'm and not about mistaken. a podcast about a podcast um there is also the shift in i think the power of what celebrities can do as well as their own understanding of their revenue potential outside of the screen or even outside of the sporting arena lebron james this week has crossed a milestone where he is the first nba player who is actively still playing but has become a billionaire he has a sports agency which is which is Uh, uh, an agency called Clutch Sports that represents him that was started by him and one of his best friends Rich Paul which tries to unlock a lot more value for other sportsmen Kanye West launched his agency yesterday called Donda Sports which What's is called again Donda Sports okay which has signed their first NFL player as well as their first NBA player but their whole play is that they're not going to represent the sports people on the field and handle negotiations with the league or with other teams but they're going to focus on the potential that these celebrities have off the field. Naomi Osaka launched her agency called Evolve 2 weeks ago, 3 weeks ago. She broke off from IMG and she's now looking to represent other players. And so there is this obvious shift where players are starting to create other modes of income for themselves, but they're also realizing the potential of their own brand value, which is something we talked about on our webinar yesterday, on our Bright Talk webinar yesterday. around the evolution of the IPL and everything it has created in terms of monetization capabilities for the league as well as for individual athletes and i think all of our obsession over the last several weeks since we've started this podcast especially on what tiktok has the ability to do has reimagined the power of influencers and i know that earlier this week you shared an article on our internal slack channel about gaming influencers yeah. and the power that they can bring to the table so gaming is 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 a preoccupation right now with most amounts most of our brands that we see most advertisers because there's a highly engaged audience there people want to engage with uh, gaming live stream gaming even gamers in general in terms of influencers and there are a lot of agencies also setting themselves up um to to represent either gamers or repre- or gamers representing themselves So there is a bunch of stuff happening in that space but what I wanted to touch upon today was this whole concept of Twitch versus TikTok right so yeah last week we spoke about TikTok and the entire uh, benefits and uh, downsides of TikTok and what you may but on Twitch Twitch which has been a, around a little longer and ha- you know kind of gained a lot of attention over the last couple of years it got acquired by um, Amazon as well and so it's got a huge uh, base Now Twitch it seems is have you ever been to Twitch? Yes I have. Yeah. And I found you know when I went to Twitch and I tried to use the the platform I'm not a gamer by any measure. But you can see people craft live. You can see them host a pottery class live. You can you can knit live, you can stitch live, you can do a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't think was going to be on Twitch. It is quite surprising. So when I saw that Washington Post has about 44,000 uh followers I'm like what is What is Washington what Post doing? even doing on Twitch, right? I mean, okay, there is craft and art and and gaming and what not, but then they live stream debates, they live stream um, various kinds of events. But there is a huge shift in how people uh, are looking at Twitch, and there's a big struggle as well with advertisers as well as publishers, and specifically from publishers and therefore advertisers uh, between Twitch and TikTok. So TikTok is easy. It's it's app based. It's it's cheap. You can you can actually experiment a lot. There's a ton of creators. You can do short little videos and you can have a you know string strategy where you have one video after the other. Twitch seems like a platform where you really need to produce your live stream. You need to come prepared. There's planning. It's appointment viewing. You have to tell your 44,000 viewers that you're going to go live at X Y Z time and therefore advertisers have to hitch on to that bandwagon it's not an any time kind of a live stream because you're not doing it so often 
but there is hope because we keep going back to this the power lies with content creators now if those content creators are people who are tiktokers or if they are old world publishers who actually have the know how and the network and the capability and talent to actually create content so be it the technology platforms are things where consumers will educate themselves or it it's upon those platforms to educate consumers but we streamed live yesterday on bright talks and and we were talking about sports live streaming and it it is it is stressful although i knew that it's not going to be something that i'm going to be streaming out to 44000 people it was going to be just our office and a couple of other people who were joining in because we were it was one of our first but it was still nerve wracking it was still one of those things that we knew once we put it out there we can never pull it back we can do some kind of editing in vod but well you know it is nerve wracking so i cannot imagine yeah. the stress that anybody has in live sports streaming in new streaming or anything else i remember the the movie social network where in one of the opening scenes where mark zuckerberg is sitting across from his his um his then girlfriend where she says the internet is written in ink not in pencil um with twitch there seems to be a healthy relationship and i'm choosing the word healthy a little carefully because that's how it seems to be as 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 a consumer and i know we talked about this yesterday during our ipl bright talk where you said you know it's a great place to be because everyone's trying to entertain us everyone's trying to take care of us yeah and the best content will always win but there seems to be this healthy relationship between twitch tiktok and youtube which reminds me of what snap went through i remember when snap launched stories and next thing you know it was on every other social media platform some might say that you're ripping off the ideas from other platforms but there seems to be this brash i don't even want to say arrogant attitude where everyone's saying well so what dunzo launched a beautiful campaign with a qr code on the on the day of the ipl final where the note from kabir the ceo specifically says hat tip to coinbase they yeah. tried it first and we did it so it's not even something that he's saying i won't acknowledge Similarly I was looking at a TechCrunch article this week which said that YouTube Shorts is now launching live commerce which is something that was pioneered by Twitch and then picked up by TikTok and it seems to me that everybody is putting creator first consumer first and is okay if someone tried something before them and they're educating us they're yeah. telling us to expect it so that we are not grappling on another platform and advertisers are winning users are winning and you know. so what i have it's like variants in your favorite uh it's getting commoditized yeah right to a large extent and that's fine that's absolutely fine and i think that's like you're saying also we win at the end of the day i love it i i don't mind because i know that a youtube short is similar to a uh, story is similar to tiktok and moj and josh and everything else closer to home um just on the last point on on uh, what you were talking about in terms of youtube upfront new fronts and uh, twitch and tiktok this whole concept of fast which is your free to air streaming television is a device play right because if you think if you if you pan out you just go slightly more macro in the entire universe youtube had brand channels way back you know when they started out every 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 publisher every brand every advertiser every person could have a brand channel in which they could house all of their information and it was monetized automatically by their adsense on for the down the line their guaranteed youtube program so for somebody to start up a channel a tv channel on a device like roku tv or pluto tv or samsung tv etc is a device play but the concept in general has been around for years right so when somebody says oh my god have you heard about fast yes i have heard about fast okay the con- the operational word is streaming television but the television aspect of it has been streaming for years already on youtube so it's definitely just a device play so if you have so any if any of you are listening to this podcast and you know you've had this thing thrown at you all uh, for a long time saying fast is the future well it's part of the future it's because everybody is now coming out with these beautiful devices that are connected to the internet and you can actually have channels that are pop up channels that you can switch on and switch off within the comfort of your television setup you don't have to go to youtube you don't have to search for it it's part of your entire channel list so what do you think about ctvs i was reading um the first party capital newsletter this week by kiran o'kane where 
he was talking about how the entire ad tech industry seems to have forgotten about the fact that CTV outside of the United States is basically just YouTube and it's a device play. And he said everyone's racing towards real-time bidding and an open marketplace and that being the holy grail in the world of CTV. Whereas he was basically talking about how there need not be this rush to have impression level ad tech in the CTV world. If you take a look at Europe, Asia Pacific, Africa and other parts of the world and how CTV is evolving in an $85 billion market um, in terms of what it is, which is something that we have been trying to debate for weeks now. But in his opinion, he said, look, it's, it's a far more premium platform where inventory is still limited. Yield is not a problem. You can command a $50 CPM on CTV. And if you go down the RTB route where you have to give away 50% of $50 to all the ad tech providers, he's, he calls it a non-starter. And in his eyes, he said the real challenges are measurement across OEMs and across platforms and across devices. The ability to aggregate supply a little better than what it is right now. And the ability to evolve behind, uh, evolve beyond IP targeting as a better mode of, of being able to identify uh, users in an anonymous uh, aggregated way. And none of this needs to have an RTV setup. This can be done directly. Netflix can do this directly. A lot of people can do this through direct sales because of the fact that it's so premium that this is possibly where the CTV market should evolve. And he calls that a, you know, a paradigm shift that CTV really, really needs to see. I agree. I tend to agree with this. You know, the concept of yield is something that YouTube can't give you because the scale is intense and discovery is so poor. You have to really spend a lot of money in the whole concept of marketing and getting people to your channel, etc. And uh, you're subject to either the market or how much that particular impression has been commoditized because it's impression based. So definitely a paradigm shift. I'm still, you know, I, both of us are still skeptical about this whole CTV business. I still think it's a buzzword. I don't know whether it's a device play, whether it's OEMs getting together, whether it'll ever happen, whether, you know, some large digital set-top box guy or industry body will just come together and just even everything out in terms of a playing field or regulation and sharing of information and data and measurement and things like that. Speaking of large industry bodies and large industries in general, Telco is seeing quite a day in India. We recently saw an article where Vodafone has now set up their own programmatic platform. We know Airtel is already in the fray. You know, Geo is already around. We, we, we heard both of them speak at this year's ad tech in India. at and is, uh, is a case study on its own. And one of the things that when we ask some people about what's so different between at and and what the rest of these guys are doing, it's that they said they're not going around trying to own all of these companies. They're not stitching together an ownership strategy. They are actually seeding and making accessible what is core to their businesses, which is all their marketing channels in terms of SMS and voice and also their audience data to all of these programmatic platforms. And they also want to build their own marketing or MarTech stack, so to speak. Do you have any opinion on what's happening there? I think execution, of course, is going to be key. But telecom companies across the world are always always have been and will continue to be in the most unique position because of how close they are to the consumer and how well they know the consumer. Most of the keynote addresses we listened to at AdTech were largely focused on telecom companies saying, this is how well I know the user. And I think that's a delicate relationship, but it's a very deep one. And that gives telecom providers the ability to build um, services on top of it. VAS or value-added services have always existed. It's just that today they have to evolve given the nature of data, the nature of the experience that we have and the nature of relationships that we all carry with our telecom providers. Um, I signed up for this Airtel Black um, uh, subscription recently and it came with all sorts of subscriptions. It came with Netflix, it came with Z5, it came with a lot of OTT subscriptions bundled in that I never even asked for. And it's kind of a waste on me because I already have some of those subscriptions or people in my family do and I mooch off of them. 
but the point calling is calling the netflix police <laughs> but the point is i think telecom companies are in a very unique position and if we jog this a little further and if third party cookies do die the death that everyone is trying to um, um, orchestrate if privacy starts to become even more important i think telecom companies are going to be in a much stronger position and what they do with that position will effectively create again more services for us but we will it will i think give them a platform on top of which they can build several services that can be of great value to us i agree so it's been quite a week i ended it on a great note with top gun i'm telling you go watch it it's fantastic if people who are listening you haven't watched it go watch it and after this podcast play the anthem because it just it is so inspiring and i love it and i love theater and i love cinema i've i've i'm super motivated about what's coming up i hope they continue and uh, have a lovely weekend thank you anand thank you bye bye